the man who has been promoting boxing and being part of the boxing world for decades now and getting set for a big time Saturday in December, December 11th, when he and Top Rank are promoting a highly anticipated lightweight battle between former champions Vasily Lomachenko and Richard Kami at Madison Square Garden. It'll be live on ESPN right after the Heisman Trophy ceremony. Good to have here Brooklyn's finest. Bob Arum here on the Rich Eisen Show in person. How are you, Bob? Good. Nice to see you again, Rich. Good to see you. It's been a few years. Yeah. It's, it's been a while. Good sure to has. see you. Yeah, it's good to see you. So uh, let me just jump into this with a little memory lane, if you don't mind. When was the first time you met Muhammad Ali, Bob? Let's just jump right into that. Uh, it would be in 1965. Okay. And uh, uh, I had met the great football player, Jim Brown. And Brown said... Uh, that I should be Ali's promoter and lawyer. Uh, I had never seen a boxing match, but I had handled a big case as a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office when we seized all the money in the Patterson-Liston fight. The SDNY, right? That's what you were with, the Southern the District? The Southern, famous Southern, Southern District, District, right. Yeah. And uh, so I met uh, 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 Ali and... Uh, uh, his advisor then, Herbert Muhammad and Jim, in a meeting, and they shipped me out to Chicago to get the blessing of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I got that blessing and uh, scheduled a fight uh, March of 66 uh, with Ernie Terrell in Chicago, and Ali, while he was training in Miami, uh, was reclassified from one Y because at that point he was functionally illiterate, mm -hmm. so he couldn't pass the test. Uh, and they made him one A. And then Bob Haller in the CBS uh, in Miami interviewed him. And that's when Ali said, I ain't going to Vietnam. I ain't going to fight the Viet Cong. They never used the N word to me. I'm just not going. And Mayor Daly uh, in Chicago, where the fight, Terrell fight was going to be held, kicked us out. We got, couldn't find a venue any place in the United States. We ended up in Toronto, and that was my first fight That's your in, first. in March of 1966. Ali and Chevalo for the heavyweight championship. Welcome to boxing. Yeah. That was your that was your welcome to boxing. No, but it was great because if when people promoted. come up to me and say, oh, this was a tough promotion that you've done, you know, like a year ago or yeah. whatever, I said, a piece of cake compared <laughs> to my first one. It all kind of broke you in and made everything that much easier from there on out. For yeah, the lack it did. Of it certainly did. And I wouldn't have stayed, uh, except I was so angry what they were doing to Ali, who by that time I had really gotten close to. Uh, that I stayed around to fight everything and took him to England and then Germany. And then Judge Roy Hoffines, who owned the Astrodome, had us come back to the United States and fight a couple of fights there. And he fought then one Zora Foley in the garden. And that was that. He was off for three and a half years. So they took his passport. Nobody would license him. I mean, horrible the way they treated him. What was he like not, when he wasn't in front of a camera? The greatest. Um, I mean, terrific. Better when he wasn't in front of the camera. He was a warm, generous human being, highly intelligent. Although, again, when I met him, he was functionally illiterate. He learned how to read and write. But he was very, very astute and intelligent, but really nice really nice. I'm not just saying this because he's no longer here, but he was a really nice person. Well, I mean, because again, we could spend hours talking about the people who you have promoted, uh, fights that you've promoted from George Foreman to obviously Manny Pacquiao and Marvelous Marvin Hagler and, and, and the names that just jump off the list, Sugar Ray and uh, Tyson, and now Tyson Fury, you've done a, a couple of fights. You said you just got off the phone with him a couple of hours yeah, ago, right? Yeah, I've been promoting I mean... Tyson Fury uh, for the last four fights, and uh, he's a real character. Oh, I no. mean, 
he is li- um, larger than life, and not just because he's so tall. He's just a, a, a great entertainer and a great personality and also a great guy. I mean, really, and I, what I've, I've really, you know, with a guy like Tyson Fury who comes from a, a very distinct background, uh, he's uh, from the G- Gypsy Nation, uh, lived in Ireland and then in uh, Northern England. Uh, the whole Gypsy culture is real. I don't want to go into it necessarily here, but is really, really interesting. And uh, so the, when I, I've made it a point to spend time with him uh, talking about different things, not just boxing. And I've learned a lot, uh, which I didn't, wasn't aware of, of the gypsy culture. So well, very he, interesting. He was here a couple of years ago, Bob, and we, we were talking to him and everyone who, who, who came with him. And I didn't understand a word they were saying, to be very honest with you. It was, he, 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 he speaks so fast. And then he, he, he sat down here and he was so remarkable in sharing his struggles with mental health and how he is so open about it and how it's important to hear him that somebody who is such a hulking individual of a, of a man who can break you in two, who gets off the mat, right, after he's been knocked down, talk about how he's struggling with what's in between his temples is so important, I think, for people to hear that story. Right, and what he's told me is even when there's no fight on the horizon and because of the pandemic, he went over a year between the second fight with Wilder and the third, uh, he was able to keep his sanity by going into the gym twice a day to train, 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 because he felt he, that training like that, mm-hmm. even when there was no fight on the horizon, uh, kept him mentally stable. What's next for him? Well, now we're very interesting. Uh, Anthony Joshua lost to Alexander Usyk, uh, who now has some of the belts. And we're trying to get, there's a rematch clause, Joshua would have step aside so that uh, uh, Tyson can fight Usyk for all four belts. That would be a unified title. And they're talking about doing it in Saudi Arabia, which uh, uh, wants to stage that fight in March. Hopefully, it'll all come together. If it doesn't, if... Uh, Joshua insists on the rematch with Usyk. Then uh, Fury will fight uh, Dylan White, who's the number one contender. And we do that fight uh, sort of a homecoming uh, for Tyson uh, in an arena in Manchester, uh, where he comes from. Bob Arum here on the Rich Eisen Show. What's the biggest fight that you weren't able to make? in your career that you're like, you know what? There was so much Michigas to use the word uh, that just you couldn't get it done or you, you wanted to get it done and couldn't get done. Which one is that, I, you know, Bob? Ultimately, I got it done. I mean, the Pacquiao fight with, uh, uh, with Mayweather, that went on for five years with a lot of nonsense <laughs> until we finally got it done and it was the biggest, uh, from a standpoint of money, the biggest fight ever uh, when they finally fought. Uh, the fight that I haven't been able to get done uh, is uh, Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence uh, because, uh, frankly, the two fighters want so much money, and while it is a great fight in the ring and b- hardcore boxing fans love it, doesn't pencil out uh, as far as pay-per-view, which is not as robust as it was uh, five or ten years ago. When you say nonsense, what do you mean by nonsense? When you said the nonsense with uh, Pacquiao and... and, Well, when first it was drug testing, there was always an excuse why the fight couldn't happen. 
So meanwhile, Floyd went his way, Manny went his way. They each made a lot of money during that period, but we couldn't get them together. It took five years to get them together. But when we got them together, we did over 4 million uh, pay-per-view homes uh, and hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars. So maybe it was all worth it in the end. Bob Arum here on the Rich Eisen Show. Um, when I say the name Don King, you think of what? What do you think well, of? King was a rival for a long time. Right. And uh, he came from a different place from the place that I came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had served time in prison, and he was a real street guy. But he had a, a way of his expressing himself that caused people to notice. Uh, he was a very good promoter. Uh, but he was a vicious competitor. But when the fight had to be made with his fighter and my fighter, mm -hmm. we found a way to do it. And he was a good partner, whether it was Leonard and Duran first fight in Montreal or Oscar De La Hoya in Trinidad. I did a number of fights with King, and they were all, you know, very successful ventures. Did you get along with him or not really? Only when we were counting up the money. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to look to see if you were getting your share? No, but I was, we collected. That was part of the was, deal. <laughs> we, we collected it. You were doing the collection and yeah, disbursement it, is what you're saying. What? You were doing the collection My company and disbursement. Was doing, you're right, and then we were dividing it. So... I didn't have that angst, other which I would have otherwise <laughs> might have had. Well, I guess that's why you're so good at it and why you've done it for so long, Bob Arum. And so, um, wow. So the do you, do you have a, a no mas story that we don't know about? Anything like that? You mentioned what do you mean a no mas? The, the Duran story and you know Roberto Duran or no, anything. No, I, like I just I I know what happened. I mean, uh, I mean it's clear what happened because I subsequently became Duran's promoter mm -hmm. uh, when he fought Iran Barkley in one of the great middleweight fights, uh, and then uh, the third fight with Sugar Ray Leonard. What happened, and Duran ex expressed it to me, and it was true, is once when Duran beat uh, Leonard in the first fight in mm -hmm. Montreal, yes. he went back to Panama, and he was like the king, and he acted like the king. Uh, I visited him subsequently, and he had a house that had expanded, and there was a pool in the back, and he would have 40 people over, uh, eating steaks and drinking champagne and having a great time. And the last thing in his mind then was fighting. And then M Mike Trainer, who was the manager of Ray Leonard, told King, in effect, you guys can keep all the money. We just want the rematch because Ray felt he could beat him. And so Carlos Aletta and King cut up a lot of money and they, they forced, in effect, Duran into that second fight before he was ready. Duran trained for the second fight basically just to lose weight. And... After the weigh-in, he gorged himself on two steaks, and I mean, crazy. And so he was in no real condition to mm. fight, you know, not fighting condition. And Ray played with him, danced around him, and Duran couldn't even hit him and was being humiliated, and he quit. That was it. He was angry at everybody, and he quit. So you've also um, promoted four Mike Tyson fights. What was that like, promoting a Mike Tyson fight, Bob Arum, for you? Well, you know, Tyson at that point was crazy. His manager and his, his uh, uh, managers were, were, were in fear of him. They were afraid uh, to let him loose between fights. They put a lot of pressure. We were doing those weekly shows uh, for ESPN mm -hmm. from 1980 to 1985. So this was in that during that period, 
and they wanted him to fight once a week because otherwise he would get into terrible, terrible trouble. And he had established a reputation of being this real killer. And so it was hilarious. You'd put him in with a fairly good professional, and you could see the opponent's uh, knees shaking. Right. And so Tyson would walk across the ring, throw one punch, knock him out, and that was that. But, you know, it, it became, it wasn't good television. It, you know, it seems great, you know, knockout and so forth. But when it goes on repeatedly, four quick knockouts, mm -hmm. we weren't getting uh, the airtime that was required, and we stopped promoting him. So let's talk about what you got going on here uh, coming up on December 11th. I got the list right here. This is going to be your 864th boxing show promoted on ESPN. Yeah, isn't that you. something? That is a, that's, a, that's a hefty number. That's a whopping fine number, as Dr. Seuss once said. This is your 48th boxing show promoted in New York City. Madison, yeah, Madison Square, Garden Square Garden in the Mecca. I mean, right. where I imagine you went... You probably grew up watching some uh, events there in Madison Square Garden. Absolutely. I mean, my father took me uh, to watch college basketball. Sure. He was a graduate of NYU, and NYU had some great teams. All the, the NYU, St. John's, LIU, sure. uh, City College. That's when the NIT was king, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so, I mean, the garden was legendary. It was in a different area at the time. Right. But I was there when they first opened the garden, uh, the new garden, and I was always in awe of the Any New York guy was in awe of Madison Square Garden. And uh, so I'm really thrilled, uh, again, to go back. Uh, it's my uh, 90th birthday. Three days before, right? Three days before. And so the family will be there, and it's a great fight. Uh, Lomachenko is a tremendous, tremendous fighter, uh, and he's fighting Comey, who's a big knockout guy. But interesting, we have some great kids on the, you know, the future on the card. I have Muhammad Ali's grandson. grandson. Isn't that amazing? You know, he's, he's, a, he's a lovely young man. Uh, I knew his mother when she was a little girl. Oh, sure. Yeah, Rashida. Uh, and uh, uh, some terrific pro prospects like uh, uh, Xander uh, Zayas uh, and Keyshawn Davis, who we signed, who probably was one of the best silver medalists. Uh, Olympians. Yeah. yeah, won a silver medal. Uh, so I'm really pumped uh, to be back uh, in my home city. Isn't that amazing? You know, because... I've lived in Las Vegas since 1986, but you can tell by my accent that I'm still in New York. Of course, I know that. <laughs> I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm born in Brooklyn, raised in Staten Island. It comes out if you cut me out, off in traffic, Bob. I'll be honest with you. So, uh, all right, two, two, two last things for you. Do you have a Sinatra story? Have you ever come across Frank at, at boxing? Yeah, okay, you yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you got for me? Anything? Well. A number of years ago, I had a, my late friend Saul Kersner, mm -hmm. who built and owned Sun City in Baputaswana, which was a homeland in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, had Sinatra there singing. And uh, Saul was a big boxing fan, and I came up with an idea that we would do two championship fights, mm -hmm. uh, and then Sinatra would do a concert. And Mickey Rudin, great, late Mickey Rudin, the, the lawyer for Sinatra, was in the hotel, and Sinatra was in the hotel in the St. Regis in New York. So Rudin, Mickey said, what a ridiculous idea. Frank could never go for it. So I said, well, let me go up and talk to him <laughs> with, with them. And... I started talking to them. I do, we do uh, Duran against Davey Moore. And he, Sinatra, I could see he wasn't interested. And then he said, and what was the other fight? 
and I said, Ray Mancini against Kenny Bott. He said, Mancini? I said, yes. He said, I'm in. <laughs> boom, I'm boom, in. got him in? Boom, boom, boom. He was a crazy boom, boom, Mancini fan. <laughs> so we we set up, a, we signed a contract, we set up a press conference, and Sinatra was at the press conference, and uh, it was going to be on closed circuit in the United States, mm-hmm. and... Uh, and uh, everything was going swimmingly well. Oh, no. I, in those days, we were not sophisticated, so I wrote the commercials. So I remember going with Lou Vopicelli, my director, Mm -hmm. to the Kennedy Center where Sinatra was to have Sinatra do the commercial. And he looked at it, and he said, terrible. And he then did his own commercial. Uh Uh-huh. For, which was great, okay, right? And a week before the fight, uh, in training in South Africa, uh, Ray's collarbone was broken. <sighs> and once that happened, Sinatra pulled out. It went down. We called it. We were calling it Chairman and the Champs. It never happened. But Sinatra, I found, was a really great guy. Terrific guy to work with. Fun guy, I really, ah. I really admired him. Riding high in April, shot down in May. I guess that's right, life. Exactly. Right, bump. Oh my gosh, you almost had it. What a, what a night that would have been. Yeah. How about that? Sinatra's a Ray Boom Boom Mancini fan. You probably never thought that was <laughs> coming today. Did, 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 did that you? Was <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so, uh, last one for you. Uh, we in this realm of sports talk um, always put people on the spot by saying, "Give us your Mount Rushmore." means you got to give me four of fighters. Do you have one for me? Yeah. Bob Barham, your Mount I mean, Rushmore they, your Mount Rushmore of fighters. Muhammad Ali. Okay. Right. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Right. Uh, Manny Pacquiao. And Tyson Fury. Those are your four. Yeah. Etch it in stone. Yeah. Hagler's a good one, huh? Yeah, Hagler was the best. What a great guy. Well, they don't call him marvelous for nothing, right? Yeah, exactly, and you know, he passed well before his time. And Ali and Fury get in the ring. What do you? Ha- what happens there? Do you think Fury wins? No, no heavyweight, <laughs> no heavyweight before or since could beat Fury. The Fury is so incredible. Guys who are six nine were bums when Ali was fighting, right? Because they couldn't move and. Uh, and there were always flaws. But here's a guy, Fury, takes an incredible punch, uh, moves like a, a welterweight, and has a pretty good punch himself, knows how to box. We haven't seen that combination ever, ever. You know, I feel sorry for Wilder, who's a terrific fighter, because he came in an era that gave us uh, Tyson Fury. And remember, it's not a fluke because Tyson Fury beat uh, Valdemir Klitschko Mm -hmm. when Klitschko was riding high and nobody gave Fury a chance. Fury is the goods because he can box, he can punch, and he keeps getting better. Happy birthday in advance, Bob Aaron. Thank you very much. Turn 90. Yeah, on, uh, on December number. 8th. Oh, the it's big only nine-o. a number. It's, it's only, only a number. It's only a number, Bob Aram. Certainly since, you know, I I, uh, I mean, clearly you're at the top of your game. That's the, You put the top and top rank boxing, that's for sure. This has been a pleasure. I know uh, I, I had met you a couple of years ago. You're like, I'll do it. I'm, no problem. Just invite. And I'm glad we finally got it done. Yeah, that I'm you're glad. Here. Much, much, much pleasure. And then again, uh, uh, happy, uh, happy birthday. And then everybody check out... Uh, Uh, Comey versus Lomachenko and so much more on ESPN. Stay tuned right after the Heisman Trophy ceremony on December the 11th. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Bob Arum right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.